Thank you very much. Thank you for your um, kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this talk. Um, so today's uh, topic is going to be on the management of the fluid overloaded patient. And I know that um, uh, some people coming into uh, this particular renal topic um, come in, comes with a little bit of mixed emotions. And then part of it is because as uh, first year medical students, you remember that the kidneys are amongst the most beautiful organ systems, um, you know, depicted by this electron microscope of the glomeruli and the branching arterioles and arteries. But then, what we then later uh, on in medical school, you learned that there were, um, you know, a little bit of things that could cause some dread when, co when it comes to renal topic, and things like tons of different transporters and a billion different ions that are flying in a million different directions. So um, this talk is not going to be concentrating on all those tr different transporters. We are going to be talking about some of them to be um, kind of highlighting the more important things when we take care of patients clinically, as well as some of the studies that come up. We'll talk about some of the mechanisms to um, elucidate a little bit about that. But, but I promise you, it's not going to be like this for the rest of the talk. Okay. So let's start with the case. Um, so this patient, we're going to go through it pretty quickly to get to the fluid overload section, but um, this uh, patient comes in with a chief complaint of, of fatigue. She's 65 years old, and she has hypertension for 18 years and lupus, and she also has CKD stage 3 um, and comes with a fever and fatigue for three weeks. Her lab shows that she has AKI. Her creatinine baseline is 1.7, um, but then um, now it's 3.75. She also has new hematuria with large blood on a UA, as well as a new nephrotic range proteinuria, where the UA shows greater than 300 um, but protein, but the protein to creatinine ratio goes from a baseline of normal, 0 0.65, to a really high uh, protein creatinine ratio, 4.1. Her complements are low. Her urine sediment shows uh, these, non, uh, these dysmorphic red cells uh, consistent with um, glomerular hematuria, and you can also see these uh, red blood cell casts. She's admitted to the hospital, and a renal biopsy shows that she has diffuse proliferative lupus nephritis. She's treated with pulse dose steroids and uh, mycophenolate. Uh, and there's a lot of different changes, differences in, in treatment, which we're not going to be talking about at this particular talk, and she was treated with intravenous furosemide for her edema. So for a timeline of her labs, uh, her baseline, again, her creatinine was 1.7 and increased to 3.75 during admission. She had um, a protein creatinine ratio that was normal that went up to nephrotic range. She peaked her creatinine to 5.4 during the hospitalization, and some of it was from the diuretics, but some of it was also because of the progression uh, or, or catching up with the disease as we were treating it. And her proteinuria started to get better, and at discharge, her creatinine did get better. It was 5.04, and her protein to creatinine ratio had come down a lot to 1.69. Still a lot from her baseline, but much improved than her, the nephrotic range of 4.1. So an outpatient follow-up, she was actually scheduled to come in a, in a week, but she couldn't make it because of transportation. So I told her, you know, I have her on cell sept, I have her on a lot of steroids. So we get, go to a local lab and get a creatinine and it's increased from 5 to 6.1, and a protein creatinine ratio went from 1.6 to even higher, 2.5. So this is not part of the talk, but we're going to be, so we asked uh, to change the mycophenolate to, cyclo, to cyclophosphamide IV to deal with that um, failure of the cell sept and the prednisone to work. But in the meantime, to get to the fluid overload, she comes in, uh, in follow-up in two weeks. 
um, uh, from discharge. And she said she's very, very swollen and so difficult to walk. And in her words, she says, it feels like carrying an elementary school child on each leg, and the legs look like flippers. So this is not her leg, but a picture of a leg that kind of looked like that, except hers was actually probably a little bit worse. Her blood pressure was 188 over 98. Her weight was 195, which I'll show you a trend of. A uh, good thing is that she didn't have any rails on exam and no JVD, and she did not have any um, gallop um, or a rub. Um, but she did have four plus peripheral edema um, all the way up to the dependent parts of the thighs. And upper extremity, she had one plus edema in her hands and her wrist. Uh, all right, so we talked about her numbers, over, um, all her numbers so far. The uh, labs, when she gets to see me in two weeks, her creatinine did get a little bit better with the change in treatment. Um, 5.95 was her creatinine. Her proteinuria did get a little bit better um, at 2 from 2.5. Um, but she is 195 pounds, and she used to be 167 pounds at discharge. Um, that is equal to 28 pounds of fluid gain in two weeks. She's currently on furosemide, 80 milligrams orally, twice a day. Okay, so, uh, so that's the case, and we're going to be going back to the case at the end. Um, so this particular talk, we're going to be um, concentrating on the loop diuretics as well as the thiazide diuretics. So the loop diuretics work at the loop of Henle, the thiazide diuretics look at, uh, work at the distal tubule. The only reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, we are not going to be talking about the potassium sparing diuretics such as spironolactone, which is a cornerstone of um, treatment of fluid overload in the chronic setting in CHF and a big proportion of our cirrhotic patients. But we're not going to be talking about this at this um, talk because we're going to be concentrating on the acute fluid overload case where we're trying to really get fluid off quickly. And that's going to be with the loop diuretics and, and perhaps with help with the thiazide diuretics. But the spironolactone is going to be a lot slower. So we're not going to be talking about that right now. Okay, the outline of our talk, we're going to be talking about the magnitude of the problem with fluid overload. We're going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of edema formation. And then we're going to go through some of the treatments um, in terms of the studies that we have. Um, some of them are good and some of them are not, not so good. Um, but a combination loop and thiazide diuretics, um, the use of alternative loop diuretics, um, bolus versus continuous strip loop diuretics, as well as a little bit on mechanical ultrafiltration. Okay, the magnitude of the problem of fluid overload, there's no prevalence on fluid overload, but the patients that are at highest risk for fluid overload are many in the United States. So in C for patients in the United States, there are 5.1 million patients with CHF, according to N. Haynes in, uh, during the studies this year. Cirrhosis, um, 633,000 patients um, suffer that disease. CKD, there are 13.6 million people, and you know, I'm, I didn't put that because it's the biggest number, I'm a nephrologist, but more so just to say that there's a lot of people from CKD1 who have proteinuria only, who have a huge amount of fluid overload, but throughout the whole spectrum of CKD, we can see patients with fluid overload, which can be pretty significant, but of course, not all 13 uh, million people. So I looked for data on nephrotic syndrome because that's one of the biggest things that we all kind of uh, worry about when we have patients with fluid overload. Um, but unbelievably, <laughs> even with like two hours of looking on um, the, all the different sources, there's not enough available data on how many people have nephrotic syndrome. Um, so there is, so I looked at different other specific diseases and FSGS causing ESRD, this data shows um, that there are 12,000 people in the United States that have that. But again, this is FSGS that has caused ESRD. And I have to thank Dr. Meliambro and Dr. Campbell for helping me find this because it was trying to find a needle in a haystack to get that number. Um, but there's, the point of this slide is to say that we have a lot of people that are at risk of, of fluid overload. And for us to try to manage it, it can become an issue. Not only is the sheer numbers of the fluid overloaded patients uh, uh, an, um, an, uh, an issue for us, but there are some studies that show that fluid overloaded patients have a higher mortality. There's um, a few studies, and this is in CHF patients, that looked at quartiles of furosemide uh, requirement. Um, so um, th this is the lowest, 0 to 40 milligrams per day, and this is the highest, greater than 160 milligrams per day. And um, they, people have um, recognized that people with lower requirements of diuretics actually have a better survival rate. 
and people with the higher quartiles actually do have a poorer survival. So these patients are very, very sick, and we're actually faced with trying to, to help them um, and deal to get them out of the fluid overload situation. So um, in our hospital at Mount Sinai um, Hospital, the, the inpatient pharmacy has specific distinct orders for furosemide placed in one year from March of uh, 2015 to the end of February 2016, 36,000 distinct orders placed. That includes stat one-time orders as well as standing orders. Um, that's, uh, and then metolazone, there are 2,000 of, uh, of those orders as well too. Orders per day, 100 of, of the furosemide orders a day and it's about six of metolazone. So, for our house staff and our pharmacy, just writing these for your smart orders and dispensing it could take your whole entire day. So I appreciate it, thank you very much. But the problem is, is that um, we, there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of um, uh, patients that we're treating with this. We should really understand it um, at, as much as we can. And special thanks to Lori Janex from IRB to make sure that everything is IRB compliant to get this information. And also for Tim Nugent from, um, far, as our PharmD who actually uh, coordinated to get the information on very short notice, actually. So, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of edema formation. So most of the edema formation pro stems from the principles of the starling forces. Um, so when you have, uh, so the starling forces, the big things are the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure. The inpatients that have CHF, because of the decreased um, cardiac output and the venous congestion. In the venous side, you're going to have a higher amount of hydrostatic pressure, and that's going to cause you to have more of this fluid that goes in, leaks into the interstitial space, and that will cause people to have edema. When patients have um, decreased osmotic pressure, and such as cirrhotic patients who um, can't jet, who can't um, generate. The, uh, the albumin, and also for nephrotic syndrome patients where we're just leaking all that albumin, those patients are gonna have a lot less oncotic pressure, which will prevent the, um, uh, the albumin from keeping the fluid in the intravascular space and causes the, again, the fluid leak into the interstitium. So that's the biggest, those are the two big reasons of why edema is formed in our patients. So you have edema, but then you have a lot of patients that are actually also um, where it's very difficult to remove the edema. And part of it is because of some of the pathophysiology, which we're gonna go into very little about. But ultimately, the furosemide and any of the diuretic, they have to get to their transporter for it to work. And um, this, the furosemide, the transporter is the sodium potassium two chloride transporter. Um, but there are obstacles in our patients with disease um, that will prevent that diuretic from get to get to that transporter. One is in, in, our, in our CHF patients, the cardiac output is low. So if you have low cardiac output, you're going to have less um, delivery of the uh, Lasix, of the furosemide to the transporter. In our patients with cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome, you're also going to have decreased delivery of the um, furosemide to the tra uh, transporter. And that's because uh, furosemide is a highly um, protein-bound drug. And protein is important because, um, again, it, it, it keeps your oncotic pressure in the intravascular space, but also because if you have less protein, less albumin in, this, in, this, uh, cir in the circulation, you're going to have all these unbound um, furosemide molecules. And these, because you have um, less oncotic pressure, will start coming out into the interstitial space with the, um, with the edema. So same principle. Um, so that's why that's also very difficult for our patients um, to, to manage. But so in turn, so on, on top of it being a difficult disease to manage with uh, treatment, we also have a lot of complications. Uh, one of the complications of fluid removal is that you can have um, the patient go into AKI. And part of that also is due to Starling's forces in terms of GFR, where GFR is equal to this constant um, times the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, which is uh, depicted by the purple line, minus the oncotic pressure in the glomerulus, um, here in the yellow line, minus the hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space. 
So um, if you start diuresing the patient a lot and, with, and removing fluid, you're going to have a lot less volume that's introduced into the glomerulus. That's going to cause you to have decreased hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, and that will cause you to have a decreased GFR. So ultimately, most of our patients, if we take out a lot of intravascular um, fluid, which we always do um, initially, we're going to see a decrease in GFR. OK, so we're going to go into treatment. Uh, the co we'll first start with the combination loop and thiazide diuretics. This is um, what they call sequential nephron blockade in the literature. So if you have patients that have um, decreased oncotic pressure and decreased cardiac output, so cirrhotic patients and nephrotic syndrome for decreased oncotic pressure, and again, like we said, decreased cardiac output in CHF patients, and we have people with volume depletion, whether it's from us inducing it by the diuresis or themselves, this uh, releases a cascade of events, um, including things like decreasing renal blood flow, because most of the blood flow now is reserved to the, what they call the vital organs, right? The, the brain and the heart, and not the kidneys, unfortunately. But uh, so decreased renal blood flow, and that will increase your renin. That's going to cause an increase in angiotensin II, as well as an increase in aldosterone. That decreased perfusion is also going to cause decrease in car uh, the carotid sinus firing, which will cause you to have increased sympathetic discharge. The reason why I bring this up is not to go into the whole uh, d depth of the cascade, but because it's important in terms of what's going on in the, in the nephron. So you know that the loop diuretics will be working at the uh, loop of Henle to uh, stop the sodium reabsorption, allowing you to get diuresis. Now, when you have somebody that's in the situation with cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome, with CHF, with fluid um, uh, depletion because of diuresis, these patients are going to have all of these hormones that are upregulated. The norepinephrine and the angiotensin II work on the proximal tubule to make you reabsorb more sodium in the proximal tubule. The aldosterone is going to work more in the late distal duct, collect, late distal tubule on the collecting duct to make you reabsorb more. So this is what they call the breaking phenomenon because despite our efforts in trying to induce diuresis by getting the sodium and water out, the nephron is compensating by these neurohormonal um, um, cat, uh, features that will make you reabsorb a lot more um, proximally and distally. So that's why sometimes it's very difficult for us to get fluid off in our patients. So, so metolazone is a thiazide type diuretic, and as you remember, thiazide diuretics work on the distal tubule. Um, but if you look at studies, it shows that metolazone also has some relative carbonic anhydrase inhibition. And so that's important because carbonic anhydrase works in the proximal tubule. Um, so like we said before, with loop diuretics alone, you're going to have the norepinephrine angiotensin reabsorb a lot proximally, um, and uh, the aldosterone will absorb distally. If you start using the metolazone, you're going to be stopping the distal activity as well as the proximal, which will allow you to have more of the sodium that's going to be rele um, released into the urine, and that will cause you to have better diuresis. Part of the uh, breaking phenomenon also includes this distal tubular hypertrophy, where uh, they show that um, usually when you have somebody that has furosemide use or loop diuretic use for a long time, you can have distal tubular hypertrophy. This is a classic teaching that most of the, uh, that all renal fellows are, are taught. Um, and going back, you can um, see that there are beautiful diagrams um, from this uh, 2014 uh, C. Jason article that shows that this distal tubule um, goes from normal to a very hypertrophied one, and they could also uh, show that the uh, transporters, the sodium chloride transporters, are also upregulated, um, explaining why it's so difficult to um, ha have more of a diuresis in some of our patients. So look, I tried to find where this original data came from, and I had to go back to this JCR, G JCI article in 1989. So they looked at these Sprague Dolly rats and looked at three different conditions. Uh, we're going to look at this condition of the intraperitoneal furosemide infusion, which they used for seven days. Um, the dose they used was 0.67 millimoles per kilo, and I had to dig up my old skills of organic chemistry to figure out exactly how many milligrams that was. And so that's 44 milligrams to 66 milligrams for our rats. 
So at first glance, I said, okay, that's not a bad dose. That's what I kind of give some of my patients. But that's per 200 gram rat, right? So for, for, a, seven, for a 70 kilogram person, that's 15,000 milligrams of furosemide. So I put this poor picture on there because this poor little rat, I probably can't even hear anymore. But anyway, the study, <laughs> the study shows that, he, well, I looked at a different study. They say that even with 200 milligrams per kilo, they don't go deaf. But in any case, it's a cute rat. Um, so, okay, so this is a huge amount, but it's, just to, it's a little bit of a weakness of the, the study, but this is what we're actually teaching all of our fellows too, right? So um, the study actually does, is helpful still because that with this really, really high dose, um, you can actually see that the, the distal tubule really does hypertrophy. This is the um, distal tubule with furosemide. These are just regular um, without furosemide. Um, and it also shows that ion transport um, is also increased. The third box, the gray box, also is the furosemide um, section. And it also shows that you do have a lot more sodium chloride um, um, uh, transport um, that from the um, furosemide infusion. So what does this mean for our human patients, right? So we don't really have that much uh, specific information just yet, but in CHF, um, I'm not, we're not going to go through this individually, but, and it's too small to actually even see, but um, most of these studies show that when you have the sequential nephron blockade, people can get better diuresis, decreased body weight, improved um, symptoms. But if you take a look here, you can barely see it, but they're like one, N of 1, 18, 4, 32. We're lucky there, right? So there's not huge studies on this. In, in cirrhosis and, um, and nephrotic syndrome, there's even less in terms of true studies, but they do have some good physiological data. In patients with cirrhosis, when patients are given furosemide, um, they see that uh, the patient can have 138 um, uh, milliequivalents of sodium in their urine per day. When they add metolazone to furosemide, they can um, almost triple it to 325 milligrams of, mil of milliequivalents of sodium per day, which translate to a lot more um, uh, fluid excretion. And if they look at specific patients, these are just plain old regular diuretics that they give at different doses, but when they start the sequential nephron blockade, when they put the metolazone on with a loop diuretic, you can see that's the stepwise approach where you can see the decrease in the actual body weight in our patients. So it does work, it does work. Um, in our nephrotic range patient, syndrome patients, also shows that for uh, the urine volume for furosemide alone is 800 per day, and the admetolazone, it can go up to about two liters a day. And also they look at the fractional excretion of sodium, which also shows an increase with the fractional excretion of sodium with the, um, with the metolazone added. So these are just physiological studies. Um, and right now we're waiting for this study with the chlorotic trial, which is in progress. And this study is a combination loop uh, with thiazide diuretics in patients with decompensated heart failure. This is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, multi-centered trial. Um, and the arms will look at uh, furosemide plus placebo versus uh, furosemide plus hydrochlorothiazide. They use hydrochlorothiazide. Um, we usually use the metolazone, um, but it's a similar principle. The weight of the endpoints are weight, reported dyspnea by the patient, as well as mortality and safety. We plan to study 304 patients, which is orders of magnitude pretty much of what we have from now and over nine months in 24 sites in Spain. So we're, we, can take, we can wait for this study to get us a little bit more information about how this really works. Okay, so that's all we're gonna talk about, the loop and thiazide diuretics combined. Um, let's talk now about the use of alterna alternative loop diuretics. We're gonna talk about torsamide because most of the studies out there is on torsamide. The alternative loop diuretics include um, the torsamide, which is a more potent loop diuretic than furosemide, meaning that um, there's a two to one ratio, meaning that 40 milligrams of furosemide is equal to 20 milligrams of torsamide. Bumetanide is also another loop diuretic, and that's even more potent. Um, 40 milligrams of, of furosemide is equal to one milligram of bumetanide. And the reason why I bring this up is because um, both of these actually have a pretty high bioavailability, 80 to 100 percent, whereas furosemide has a very uh, wide range of 10 to 100 percent in terms of bioavailability. Just to review for our third year medical students or fourth year medical students that are here, um, bioavailability means the uh, amount of drug that is in the circulation when given orally, 
uh, divided by the amount of drug that could be seen in the circulation when given directly intravenously, the same dose. So most of the times when you learn, when you're taking care of the patients on the floors, you always know that if somebody comes in with a furosemide dose at home of 80 milligrams a day, that's equivalent to IV furosemide of 40 milligrams a day. And that's because most people look at furosemide in the middle with 50% bioavailability. When you're looking at torsemide and bumetanide, they have a much higher bioavailability, meaning 80 to 100%. And this becomes very important in the treatment of our fluid overloaded patients um, because you have many different things that actually affect bioavailability that from the time you swallow the pill to the time it reaches the circulation. We're going to be uh, looking at this, not absorbed through the intestine. There are layers of um, absorption in the GI tract from the lumen through the mucus layer, through, through water, through the epithelial layer, layer, and then the capillary. You're gonna have, uh, when you have patients with fluid overload, you're gonna have a lot more um, edema, including um, abdominal, um, including um, intestinal wall edema, and a lot bigger water layer. That's gonna decrease your ability to, re, uh, to absorb the furosemide. And we've all seen some of our patients that even have like abdominal wall edema. It's not to say that abdominal wall edema is always correlated with gut wall edema, but um, if you look at some of these studies, uh, this is a, a, a pretty extreme case of fluid overload in this um, article that showed a pancreatitis patient. But you can see that in, in CAT scans, uh, this, this target-shaped gray area thing looks like is water. Um, so you can definitely see all these um, target shapes, so a lot of uh, uh, fluid, intestinal wall edema in this patient with fluid overload. This is what we have to get through to get the furosemide in the system and then to the kidneys, to the transporter. So I was looking at studies and um, uh, people who know me actually are, would know how excited I was to see that there was an actual meta-analysis looking at furosemide versus torsemide and they looked at 2,000 studies. I was so happy. And people who know me also know how disappointed I was to see that the studies they looked at were two because those are the only good studies that are out there. So, but I'm gonna go through it a little bit. They only looked at 200 patients each and they looked at CHF patients, but they were randomized and they looked at them for about 12, nine to 12 months. So not a really long time, but it's something. So when they look at the uh, meta-analysis, in terms of total heart failure, readmi all, all of these are read readmission. So total heart failure readmission actually favors torsemide. For, pay, for heart failure, for one, at least one heart failure readmission also favors torsemide. And cardiovascular readmission, at least one, also favors torsemide. But there's no difference in the relative risk for mortality in both studies. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good start, but it's a, in a very small amount of patients. So um, this study is not randomized, but it is looking at torsemide and furosemide in the ASCEND heart failure trial. You know, this is the big study, that international uh, randomized trial that looked at the efficacy and safety of nasiratide in the treatment of our CHF patients. And they looked at 7,000 patients over 30 countries. And so they looked at this data to try to figure out, is the, um, does it work, does torsemide and furosemide, does it make a difference? And the endpoints that they looked at were all-cause mortality and hospitalizations for heart failure. So the patients in ASCEND, if you look at the patients, they actually, 3,000 of them had furosemide on discharge, torsemide only 500. Again, remember, this is not randomized for these drugs. And so that's why there's a lot of differences in terms of the baseline characteristics. The EF was just a little bit different by five, the blood pressure was a little bit different by five, um, and some of the uh, peripheral edema and, and were also different. The creatinine, you know, statistically was different, but it was really the same, 1.2 to 1.3 clinically. Different medications they were on as well too, which we're not gonna go into. So because this is not randomized, they used a propensity score, and for our medical students, just as a review, a propensity score tries to minimize the confounders for a non-randomized study. So you look at all the patients that had furosemide, and you look at all the patients that were discharged in torsemide, and you match pair them based on selected variables. And the variables they used were the country of origin of the study, um, the B1 and the, um, the blood pressure, as well as the heart failure and JVD. And we, we can argue if these were the variables to use, but those are the ones that they used to actually match these patients. Then they come up with a propensity score, and they, then they analyze the data. 
And the reason why they do this is because the propensity score is used in this inverse propensity weighted model, which will reweight the data and create almost like a pseudo population of patients in which the patient characteristics are independent of which treatment they received. So it tries to stimulate randomization. It's not perfect, but it's a huge trial. So it's one of the better things that we can see if there's a, a, a difference between torsamide and furosemide. So the results of the ASCEND heart failures trial showed that in terms of mortality, adjusted and unadjusted, there was no statistically significant um, difference between furosemide and torosemide. In terms of, hospital, in terms of uh, mortality and rehospitalization, again, this was not showing any statistical significance. All right, so this is the problem right now, right? So we have very little data, but we do have good physiological data of why the adding of the, um, the uh, why the change of the furosemide to the torosemide works. And so that's why people use it um, um, in their practices. But that's the state of the studies that we have at this point. All right, we're gonna go on to uh, bolus versus continuous drip loop diuretics. Now, those, so everything we've talked about so far are patients that we can try to treat when they are in the outpatient setting with a little bit of adding the metolazone to the loop diuretic or changing to a different loop diuretic. And those things work, but sometimes, no matter how hard we try for our patients that are outpatient to maximize their fluid um, uh, overload, uh, or ma not maximize, to minimize their fluid overload, they will still have a, hu will have a huge challenge to face ahead of us. And so that's when we start thinking about getting them admitted. And when we get them admitted, we ask to ourselves, what do you want to do? Do you want to do continuous infusion uh, diuretics, or do you want to use just um, a, a bolus um, amounts of, of furosemide? Okay, so this is actually a trial that was, um, uh, that was published in New England Journal in 2011, and it's the Dose Optimization Strategies Evaluation, the DOSE trial. This is a prospective randomized double-blind control study and they had 300 patients um, enrolled in 26 sites in the United States as well as Canada. And they were randomized to four different arms. Um, but what we're, and so it's low dose and high dose, which we're not going to be talking about at this uh, particular um, uh, hour. But uh, they looked at furosemide IV bolus administered every 12 hours versus the furosemide IV continuous drip. Um, and this was double blind, double dummy, meaning that all patients either received an IV bolus or a continuous infusion. So one was uh, the drug and one was a saline um, equivalent in terms of volume. And they were treated for 72 hours. The inclusion criteria were that they had to be, pre be presenting to the hospital within 24 hours with CHF. And those included, uh, they had criteria with one symptom of these symptoms, dyspnea, orthopnea, or edema, and at least one sign, meaning rails, peripheral edema, ascites, or pulmonary vascular congestion on chest x-ray. So they had to have a history of chronic CHF, no pre-specified EF, and they had to be on an oral loop diuretic for at least one month prior to the study and the hospitalization. And that meant furosemide or its equivalent, of 80 to 240 milligrams a day. So these patients um, are chronic CHF patients that have been on a significant amount of, uh, moderate to significantly high amount of furosemide a day. They excluded patients that were, were hypotensive, and they also excluded patients whose creatinine uh, were greater than three. Um, patients that have, uh, required IV vasodilators or inotropic agents were also excluded. They looked at two primary endpoints. One was the patient's global assessment of symptoms where they had a visual analog scale uh, where they drew a line that was 10 centimeters in vertical and they would say the lowest part was the worst you ever felt and the top was what the best that you ever felt. And they quantified that serially and quantified it as area under the curve. And the um, safety endpoint of changing serum creatinine from baseline to 72 hours uh, was, um, was looked at. They looked at a bunch of secondary endpoints, which I'm not going to go through now, but I'll show you later in a, in a table form. And this I'm only showing you because to show that they did have, most of them did wind up having an EF of 35%. Um, in the bolus versus the continuous. They had a lot of comorbidities, um, uh, diabetes, hypertension, ischemia, AFib, um, and the creatinine was about 1.5 in these patients. 
So looking at the global assessment of symptoms in 72 hours as area under the curve, looking at the bolus versus continuous infusion, they saw that there was really no big difference um, statistically between how the patients felt, whether it was the bolus or the drip. In terms of the mean serum creatinine level, um, you also see that there is, again, no statistical significance between the bolus and the, the, uh, the, uh, the continuous drip. Um, and, and there are very little differences. Like if you look at this change in creatinine of 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. The secondary endpoints, they looked at many of them, and they were all not significant, so we're not going to go into it in detail. But the things the clinically that we're interested in is net fluid loss, as well as hospital stay, length of hospital stay, and it made no difference whether we used either the bolus or the continuous. They also looked at this composite endpoint of death, rehospitalization, and emergency room visits, and they found that that also showed no statistical significance between using the bolus and the continuous infusion. So the dose trial, when you look at the overall amount of furosemide they received, the, um, it, was, um, it was not significant, p-value of 0 0.06. Um, intermittent amount got 592 milligrams and continuous got 480. So comparable amounts of furosemide administered to both groups. But uh, it shows no statistical, statistical difference in the primary endpoints, which were patient symptoms as well as increase in creatinine and no statistical significance for our secondary um, endpoints, such as net fluid loss, hospital stay, as well as a composite endpoint of death, uh, rehospitalization, and ED visit. They also, uh, this is actually from one of the uh, appendixes that wasn't published, but um, is available online, and it shows that in terms of adverse effects, uh, also no statistical significance, meaning um, you know, no, no increase in any cardiac events, including um, ventricular tachycardia and any kind of atrial fibrillation. Um, and also, um, in terms of electro, uh, elect, uh, electro, electrolyte disturbances, like the hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, and hyponatremia, everything was about the same. Um, and the renal failure as well was also about the same as well. So, you know, so looking at this study, it was a, a well-done study, a very, um, a pretty, pretty um, large study as well for, um, for a study of this topic. Um, and so to think about why there is not much of a difference, part of it comes from some of the physiological data that we know about furosemide. Furosemide um, and all these loop diuretics work at, with this diuretic threshold dose effect, meaning that, you know, as you increase your diuretic dose, um, you're going to have not much change in terms of um, the sodium excretion. So sodium excretion will also use as a surrogate marker for the uh, medicine getting into the circulation and the transporter. So as you go up on the dose, you don't get much of an effect until you reach a threshold, and then that's when you start having the diuresis. Now, some of our patients with cirrhosis and CH, so most of the data is on CHF, and there's some data on cirrhosis too, that this graph is shifted to the right, in these, in, this pop, in these two populations. And so that means you need a higher dose of furosemide to actually get a diuretic effect. And once you get to the diuretic effect, you don't even get to maximal response. You actually also have data for chronic kidney um, disease um, that also shows that you have a shift to the right where you do need higher doses of the furosemide to actually get a diuretic response. Sometimes they do show that you can get to a maximal response if that CKD is not that severe enough. Nephrotic syndrome, there's not much data, but most people feel that that's also a little bit lowered in terms of maximal response. So, you know, in looking at this data, um, if you also look at the same data, the sodium excretion or the amount of uh, drug that gets to the, the transporter, when you start using these boluses of large doses of furosemide, you can get big fluctuations, pretty high peaks of the drug and pretty low peaks as you dose it. When you have patients that are, inter, uh, that are on continuous drip, you can have, it, have the amount that's kind of in the middle. So if you look at this, you have so many of these points in terms of the intermittent doses where you have a lot higher concentration as compared to the continuous. But then on these troughs of the intermittent, you can see that the, the intermittent bolus infu uh, infusions, you can get a lot less concentration as opposed to the same time point when you give a continuous infusion, right? So I think this is why you have a little bit of a trade-off, why you find no improvement, because 
in all, it, 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 if you look at it, you do have some times where the continuous gets you higher doses of furosemide and some points where you have higher doses of the intermittent boluses. So right now, the, the, this data shows that there is not much difference between the bolus versus the continuous drip. Okay. Now, we're going to talk one uh, last topic, and that's about mechanical ultrafiltration. We're going to talk a little bit about this, not a lot, because you're going to come across a lot of patients that you've done everything for, all the orals, all the different, different um, IV um, uh, formulations, and still you're going to run into problems. So that's when you call for ultrafiltration mechanically. And ultrafiltration can be done in three different ways. One is hemodialysis that we're all um, used to and, and uh, seeing um, in, uh, all, on all different floors, as well as um, CVVH, which is only in our ICUs, and also aquaphoresis, which is CHF solutions, which is um, just fluid removal, also done in our ICUs. Okay, so most of the times, I'm gonna look at the comparison of ultrafiltration modalities in our hypotensive patient because nobody will be using CVVH on a hypertensive fluid overloaded patient. So this is just to kind of show you that in terms of clearance, you can get clearance with both hemodialysis and CVVH, but in terms of the aquaphoresis with CHF solutions, you do not get any clearance. Ultrafiltration, you can do with all three. And um, treatment duration, hemodialysis is intermittent, whereas CVVH and CHF solutions is continuous. The frequency of treatment, uh, usually hemodialysis we do three times a week, both for CVVH and aquaphoresis we do that daily. The fluid removal um, prescription in a patient for hemodialysis that's hypertensive, we can get a lot off. We can get up to four liters off or even more in a patient uh, with hemodialysis. But in a hypotensive patient, that short amount, that three hour treatment will only allow us to get a very little amount off. Sometimes we're lucky if we could even get one liter off. Um, sometimes we wind up um, zero and sometimes embarrassingly we send them back upstairs with a little bit of positive net fluid because they're so hypotensive downstairs at that dialysis. So, but in terms of CVVH and, and um, aquaphoresis, you can set that rate to 50 to 100 milliliters per hour, which is very well tolerated across all patients, almost, almost all patients, even if they're on pressors and sometimes even high dose pressors. And that's pretty significant because in terms of total UF per day, that's going to be equivalent to 1.2 to 2.4 liters if you just target to 100 milliliters per day. Um, uh, and even higher if you target for higher. I've seen some, pe uh, some people go up to 200 or 400 mLs per hour. Um, whereas in ultrafiltration from hemodialysis, you can get maybe one to two liters uh, or zero to one liters in a very hypotensive patient. So how does ultrafiltration work? Um, this is our um, trusty dialysis machine and the, the magic of the machine really comes in this dialyzer, so this filter where you have the blood that goes in. So when you cut open, the, if you cut open this dialyzer, you see many of these hollow fiber, uh, hollow fibers that's within that, um, that um, the dialyzer. Blood goes in the lumen of the hollow fiber and you have the, um, uh, you have, um, the fluid coming out. And this is equivalent to that. So the, 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 the reason why the, the fluid comes out is because this pump will actually cause you to have increased pressure that will allow that fluid to come out um, and then it goes out into the back of the machine. So this is how ultrafiltration is, um, is, um, is generated in all different forms of ultrafiltration, the di dialysis, the aquaphoresis, as well as the CVVH. So there is, there are, there's a lot of studies on this, but mostly are, are all on our CHF patients. Um, and this meta-analysis looked at 900 studies and ultimately looked at 12 studies. This, um, this is a floor, forest plot that looked at fluid removal and it, looked, and it showed that um, in terms of fluid removal, the studies show it, that it favored ultrafiltration and in terms of weight loss also favored ultrafiltration to the control which was, um, which was intravenous loop diuretics. All cause hospitalization and all cause mortality, however, was not significant, it was the same between the, um, the conservative um, diuretic uh, uh, management as well as the ultrafiltration. So they also looked at secondary data, uh, secondary outcomes that included serum creatinine and that showed no statistical significant, a mean difference of 0 0.01 and unscheduled Medicare, uh, medical care, meaning emergency room visits and that also uh, was not much difference in terms of um, the, um, the, the risk. <clears throat> But 
you know, we look at the studies a little bit more carefully in terms of creatinine. Um, these, these are big study studies. All the our cardiologists um, always are looking into the unload um, uh, study. It was one of the biggest ones that came out first. Um, and, you know, the unload and the core study, both of them um, had patients that had no change with serum creatinine. And both of those protocols, she said that the, the physician could change the UF rate from this one anything up to 500, this one up to 100 to 500. This caress heart failure trial, this study did show an increase in creatinine. And this particular protocol, when I was reading it, and I, they don't give the specific details, but it says that it's set, the UF arm, the ultrafiltration is set at 200 mLs an hour. And our patients with CHF sometimes can't tolerate that. There's nothing in terms of blood pressure that they actually mention on it. But if you take a look at it, you can see the red is the ultrafiltration. The creatinine did increase from baseline. Pharmacological therapy, the creatinine actually got better because most of these patients were cardiorenal, so you got them back on the Sterling curve and got them better cardiac output to the kidney. Um, but if you look at the actual um, the mean change from baseline, it, it wasn't that different. It was, you know, at most 0.1 negative to point so about about 0.3 difference in creatinine. But it was statistically significant. Both, though, when they followed them up in, at 30 and 60 days, showed that they did have an improvement in creatinine because they did get fluid off ultimately. But the ultrafiltration patients didn't improve as much as your diuretic patients. And part of that might be because there's no blood pressures given at this particular study, but perhaps those um, intermittent decreases in blood pressure throughout the, the, the therapy did put a little bit of, um, of damage to the kidney, and that's maybe why you didn't have as much of an increase, uh, improvement in, in uh, renal uh, disease as the others. Okay. So they're not that huge. They're, the studies are not that big. They're 200, 188, 56 patients. So um, they, so in, in looking at the, to see if there's anything bigger, I found this uh, aquaphoresis versus intravenous diuretics for hospitalization in heart failure um, study. It's called the avoid heart failure. Multi-center trial randomizing one-to-one -to, -one to IV diuretics and ultrafiltration. 810 hospitalized patients were planned to be studied. Um, 40 highly experienced institutions that knew how to titrate diuretics and knew how to titrate ultrafiltration. And the endpoints they looked at were heart failure events, meaning heart failure rehospitalization, as well as um, un unscheduled outpatient visits. They looked at also mortality and serum creatinine. And I was so excited when I saw this study. But then they said that the sponsor changed to a different company during the study. And they terminated the study because of the time to enrollment. So we don't have the study. It was underpowered to actually show improvement. And it would have been a great study to really show if it actually um, made an improvement, whether we use intravenous diuretics or the aquaphoresis. But that's what we have in terms of our studies. And we still have this patient to take care of all the patients that we have in our offices. So let's look at this our patient again. So she had um, AKI, lupus nephritis, was treated. Um, and discharged with a little bit of uh, a, a, a high creatinine. She comes back with a creatinine of 5.95. I'm treating her now with intravenous cyclophosphamide. Her proteinuria is still there, um, and um, her weight gain is now 28 pounds over two weeks. So what do I do with this patient? What would you do with this patient? Could admit her, right? She's in renal failure. But if I said, look, I'm treating the lupus nephritis, don't worry about the creatinine. Well, I say this, but don't worry about the protein and the creatinine ratio and creatinine, although I will worry about it. But that, that, that don't, don't put into your uh, calculation of what you want to do with the patient. But she does have a creatinine of 5.95. Most people would probably say, admit this patient, give her intravenous diuretics, watch her very closely. But this is a time when actually. Um, she, this was, uh, and she's on 80 milligrams of furosemide twice a day. So this is in November. I was on service, and the emergency room was crazy, crazy busy. She didn't want to go there. She was there before when I admitted her for the lupus nephritis. And I called bed board, and I said, how, can I, how fast can I get a bed? And they said, maybe three days. So I said, oh, I can't do that. So I started to treat her oral, uh, with oral medications for now, because at least something is better than nothing waiting in the emergency room, right? So, or waiting for a bed. So, so looking at this, so she's on 80 milligrams twice a day. So this is, these are the dates, the weights, and what I did, and uh, what things we can do. Her creatinine number is 5.95. I'm very nervous doing this, but I had to do something because she's very uncomfortable. And she's not an extremist. She has no rails. She has no JVD. 
and her blood pressure is really high, so I had room to go. So, um, so I, what I did is I added the metolazone because she was on diuretics for a really long time in the hospital intravenously. And so when I added the metolazone to the same dose, the 80 milligrams of uh, furosemide BID, her initial weight decreased for, to by five pounds in one day. I got a little scared because the creatinine is 5.95, so I immediately asked her to decrease her, um, her furosemide to 60 and 40, and that kind of stabled her down a little bit. And I, we adjusted her furosemide quite frequently to make sure that we can try to decrease that weight. My usual goal target of weight loss in a patient that does have CKD uh, um, or significant um, blood pressure issues is only about one to two pounds a day. And in order to do that, she was very diligent, got weights every day for me, and we tried to make sure that we made sure that she did not lose more than one to two pounds. And sometimes we were successful and sometimes we are not, but overall we were. So over this whole entire time, she did it for every day here, but I didn't put all of it because otherwise it would make this table too big. But so over 18 days, she lost 35 pounds. And with that, her creatinine went from 5.95 to 5.11. So that's because we made sure that, because she was great, she checked her weights all the time, but also because we made sure that we slowed it down to make sure that we're not going too quickly. Okay. So let's talk about a quick summary of what we talked about. This is an approach to the patient with acute fluid overload, meaning that a lot of people do, do it differently, but this is sometimes how I kind of look at patients. Um, so first, fluid restrict and sodium restrict. Avoid NSAIDs because you want to get good per, uh, perfusion to the kidney. When you start with furosemide, orally or IV, you start with uh, 20 if they're uh, furosemide naive, but then you go to 40, then double it to 80. You could Go, double it to 160 as, and as high as 200 for, for, uh, that, that I'm comfortable with. Sometimes if they're not that bad, I can even use like a 100 milligram um, interval as well. Once I see a diuretic response to that dose, I can use that in multiple doses. Um, and this is due because of the, uh, the fact that we talked about this diuretic threshold dose effect. You got to keep ramping up that dose until you see an effect, then you'll start seeing the diuresis and maintain that diuresis. If a patient has been on furosemide before this acute event, then you may consider adding metolazone because you know that the breaking phenomenon will be probably in play at this point. And if you use the metolazone or any thiazide diuretic, you can actually stop some of the reabsorption in the other segments of the nephron, allowing you to actually get some of this fluid off of the patients. If a patient has enough fluid that you're worried about gut edema, then you consider using maybe torsamide. And that's because of the increased bioavailability of the torsamide as compared to furosemide. Um, you know, there's a lot of data on torsamide and not as much on bumetanide, but in terms of true um, uh, physiology and, and true uh, pharmacology, because bumetanide also has a pretty high bioavailability, you can actually also should bypass gut wall edema with uh, bumetanide as well too. And very, very important is to have close follow-up of weights. Target to one to two kilogram uh, um, pounds per day. I'm sorry, one to two pounds per day for a patient. Um, and you want to check the blood pressure, the creatinine, potassium, magnesium in one to two weeks to make sure you're not causing any problems. And I know that you're saying, oh, Tony is going to give all my patients you know, homework and have them do weights, but this is crucial. If you're really serious about getting fluid off without causing damage to our CKD patients or AKI patients, we have to make sure we're not overdoing it. Okay, if there's no response to oral um, diuretics, then convert to intravenous furosemide or any of the loop diuretics. And in the bolus versus continuous infusion is about the same. And if all else fails, then we're going to be considering ultrafiltration. So the, the studies in fluid overload, um, the, it's a very frequently encountered problem, but there's not great studies. And, and really, in, in true, uh, to be truthful, I, in preparing this talk, there was a, some frustration, or maybe a lot of frustration, that there's a lack of large, multi-centered, randomized trials for this topic. But uh, looking at the glass, I guess, half full, you can, this also means there's a big opportunity for us to do really good future studies for this patient. And we have a big population that we can actually work on. So even with the studies that we have, some are good and some of them are not as good, but still good solid foundational physiological data. 
So given all this, we still have a, a lot of patients to take care of. So as you take care of your patients, if you run into any issues that you want to consult our renal uh, physicians, we have a whole bunch of great doctors in our division. Dr. Murphy, our chair, Dr. He, our division chief, all of our inpatient doctors, um, patients that are VA, and also all of our outpatients. So you have a ton of pa people that you can actually ask for help for if you need it. But, um, but thank you very much. That's it. Thanks for a fine presentation. <clears throat> it reminds me a bit of uh, uh, my days in full-time academic medicine just yesterday, uh, when a high percentage of chairmen of departments came from renal physiology, including uh, my favorite in those days, uh, Sam Fear at Yale, who happened to attend the same public school in Brooklyn that I did, so that was a plug. Uh, it is said, it is said that uh, fluid overload patients who are black and or women do much better in outcome than others. I don't know if you believe that, but you might speculate on it. I actually have not come across that data. Um, no, but I could look it up. But it's not. Right. Oh, yeah. I wonder if there's a difference between the chronic and acute kidney injury we see due to medical underlying problems, whether it's diabetes or lupus, compared to what we induce by diuresis. Because it seems that if we're going to be treating chronically overloaded, volume overloaded patients, we need to tolerate a certain amount of, you know, if you will, renal insufficiency. So is there a difference between those well, two types of renal insufficiency? Uh, th there is a difference. Um, part of it is because, um, you know, the, the ones we induce, we can actually try to minimize that amount, right? So there's always a fine balance between how much volume overload can we tolerate and how much of an increase in creatinine can we also tolerate. So that, so it's a little bit of time limited of CKD, but of course, with a long time, it can lead to more prolonged CKD. But in terms of the patients that have the acute reason for it, so if it's something like lupus, that's actually reversible with good medications. When it comes to hypertension and diabetes, a lot of times the, in, the kidney failure induced by that, sometimes it progresses even with pretty tight control if you catch them a little bit late. So it's really a matter of more of the temporal thing, how, how, how long we can kind of um, manage those patients. So, so in real in volume overload, if we need high doses of diuretics over long periods of time, do you see that same, if you will, physiologic path where? It's perhaps? all different. It really depends on how quickly you take the fluid off. Again, remember, most of it is because you're taking the fluid out of the intravascular space. If I see a patient that the creatinine is increasing because I'm inducing a little bit too quick of a diuresis, if I pull back, Usually, if the, creatinine, if the kidney's not that far off, we will be able to see some improvement in creatinine, even a little bit. So it really depends on each individual patient. So in our, in our nephritis patients, we use high-dose steroids. So how much do you think that contributes to the fluid overload? And, okay. and we're not really thinking about that. Should we be using medical or some other? Great question. So uh, the, the, the reason why the steroids in, uh, induce the fluid overload is because they do have some mineral corticoid effect. So for the most part, there's a very little mineral corticoid effect as compared to the glucocorticoid effect with all the diuretics we use, the Medrol or the, um, the prednisone. Um, so there's not huge amounts, so a little bit more in terms of the um, uh, mineral corticoid effect with the solimedrol than the prednisone. Um, but I think at the, the bottom line is that we shouldn't use that as our, um, our decision marker to decrease your steroids, just use it to treat the, the kidney disease because without that, then no matter how much we're doing to re, uh, help with the fluid overload, we're still gonna be kind of defeated. So treat the kidney disease first and then we'll work with the fluid overload because ultimately, when we get them better, their steroid requirement will be lower and then we can get that um, fluid off a little bit easier. One last question. Uh, so when you uh, showed us the bioavailability uh, was that done in normal people or in fluid overloaded people? And may I assume that in this day, you're, you're just doing clinically what we always did. If a little didn't work, increase the dose. 
so the second question I'll answer first, uh, how, we, how do we manage this? So we, it's all clinical, right? If it doesn't work, then we do increase the dose. And because of the threshold effect, we double it until we can get that effect. Um, the bioavailability data, those are done in, uh, in normal people. And it, even in normal, uh, not meaning, I'm not sure how many people actually had fluid oral, I don't think anybody did with those. This is old, old data that we're looking at. That those patients really, so furosemide range from like 10% to 100%. So even in, in normal population, you have a big variability. But because of the gut wall edema, and because we know that that's, that edema is going to hamper the absorption of the actual drug, we do know that the bioavailability of furosemide is going to be a lot lower. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.